Okay, so we're going to jump right into our sort of first official module, I guess, where we're going to talk about 16S sequencing. Uh, it was a great introduction this morning, and I just want to encourage, you know, that uh, this is a workshop for everyone here. So if you have questions, I really encourage you to, to ask them. I think it's one of the nice opportunities from a workshop like this. There's a lot of content on the web, but you don't get a chance to really ask you know, questions that are maybe you think are dumb or not dumb or more specific questions. So feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm happy to, to try to answer questions. There's other people in the room that can answer questions. People, you know, even the trainees here will actually sometimes know some of the, uh, some of the content. Um, you'll also find that as we go through the rest of the workshop, you know, it is not a for sure certain thing that you must do this. There will be a lot of, well, you could do it this way or that way. Uh, and so that's sometimes unsatisfying. But I think just knowing the different options out there and understanding, you know, what's not a hard, fast rule and what is flexible is part of that. So sometimes a nice discussion can start as well from the trainees. Uh, and then I recognize, too, that people are coming here from a lot of different experiences, right? So some of you have probably never logged into a cloud instance. Uh, many of you have never probably even worked on the command line. That's okay. We're here for you. Uh, there's other people that are a bit more advanced. Uh, there's people who have done microbiome analysis in the past. Some people that have never, you know, are still trying to figure out what 16S versus metagenomics. So that's completely understood. You're in the right place. Uh, and so we just want to, you know, basically the, the focus of this workshop is really to make sure that we come out the other end Everyone has a pretty good foundation of where they're starting from. Right? It gives you confidence to really venture out on your own and, and process data. Okay, so with that, we're going to get started. So uh, in this module, I'm going to talk for about an hour or so, maybe less with questions, I'm hoping. Uh, and we're going to talk about 6NS, which is kind of the basics. Uh, and I think it's a pretty good place to start because it's well-defined uh, on the bioinformatics steps that you can do, whereas you'll see tomorrow when we dive into metagenomics. There's a lot more different options out there for different types of analysis. Uh, I am from Dalhousie University. Uh, my name is Morgan Langell. I guess I should have said that first. I am an associate professor there. Um, and uh, before we get into it, I just thought I'd run through a few things just about my own research. So one is out of my lab, I run the Integrated Microbiome Resource or the IMR. It's basically a sequencing and bioinformatics service core out of my research lab. I started back in 2015, pretty much when I started my position. Um, and we've done a lot of sequencing, a lot of microbiome sequencing. So uh, we actually just passed the thousand uh, sequence run just last weekend, which was pretty exciting. A lot of that is 16S sequencing, but we also do metagenomic sequencing. Uh, we also do pack bio sequencing. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit today in this lecture. Uh, and we, you know, we handle a lot of samples from local at Dalhousie across Canada. I know there's lots of people that do sequencing here at Calgary. I'm not trying to convert everyone. I'm just trying to give you a, a flavor of what I do here. And we do a lot of samples across the world. So uh, I do run that. Uh, I do do some bioinformatic tool development. So in my lab, our research kind of focuses on particular research projects, which I'll talk about in the next slide and some bioinformatics development and testing of different bioinformatic methods. So uh, we're gonna use Microbiome Helper a bit and I'll explain what that is, which is just basically you know, a resource for uh, different types of tutorials and standard operating procedures for bioinformatics. Um, I was a developer of the first PyCrust version and uh, a PhD in my lab generated PyCrust 2. I'm not gonna talk a lot about PyCrust in this actual workshop. I'll briefly mention it tomorrow uh, but if you have questions about it, I'd be happy to try to answer them, you know, in the break times. And a couple of newer tools developed in the rat lab is POMS, which is a differential abundance method, uh, and Jarvis, which is a visualization method, which we may or may not use uh, in the lecture, in the workshop tomorrow. Uh, from a research perspective, I've covered quite a few different things. We tend to jump around in different research in the past. I've worked on inflammatory bowel disease and pediatric, uh, a bit on exercise. Uh, but right now in the lab, our, our major focus is our uh, cancer, and for that, we're looking at saliva, blood, and tumor samples. Uh, mental health, we're mostly looking at uh, connections between oral microbiome and mental health in adolescents. Uh, and we have a project ongoing with frailty, and for that one, we have saliva and stool. I'm just listening to the tissue types there, so you get a sense of the different types of tissues that we uh, do microbiome profiling on. <clears throat> 
So I'd be happy to chat about any of that, you know, on the, uh, the off times, but let's get right into why you're here. Okay, so the learning objectives for uh, this lecture is uh, to help you understand what amplicon sequencing is, what that term is, the, that the, there's different amplicon targets besides just 16S and why you might use those. We'll talk about variable regions, which is always a nice little debate. Uh, and then we're going to get right into the major bioinformatics steps of a 16S analysis pipeline. Uh, and we're going to really understand then, you know, when you get through that pipeline, what are the outputs that you're going to use in future downstream analyses? Okay, great. So uh, John already talked a bit about, you know, methods for studying microbiome. We talked about 16S, we talked about metagenomics, right? And we talked about metatranscriptomics and maybe even uh, metabolomics. Um, and when we think of 16S sequencing, we can group that into something that's just a bit beyond 16S sequencing. So we can turn that, we can call that amplicon-based sequencing. Some people call this marker-based sequencing, gets lots of different terms. But amplicon is just a fancy term for, you know, amplifying up a piece of DNA through PCR or RNA. But in most of these cases, we're always talking about DNA. And if we're thinking about then profiling a microbiome community, we're hopefully going to have a target that's a universal gene or barcode, okay? This is actually quite a bit different than you might've heard about barcoding from a eukaryotic standpoint. You may or may not have, you know, if you've seen those things about the fish you eat is not the fish you buy in the market. Those are like a barcode specifically for that taxa. In this case, we're looking for a particular gene that's found in all the, the microbes that we're interested in in the hopes of sequencing it all and then categorizing them. 16S or amplicon sequencing is very beneficial for telling you the types of microbes, obviously, in that community, who is there. Not so much on the functional side, but we can talk about that a bit later. Um, and it's important to remember that, you know, based on the amplicon that we're choosing and the variable regions, we're restricting our field of view to that actual target, right? Where something like metagenomics, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, is just blanket, we're sequencing everything. And so that's going to get everything in the sample. You are going to sort of restrict your view to, to some of those targets. So the most common one that we're gonna talk about obviously is the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Uh, ribosomal RNA genes are just what they sound like. They're present in all living organisms. They are uh, ribosomal, they're, they are an RNA gene. So they don't form a protein product, right? They're part of the ribosome. They're important for structure. Uh, and because of this uh, fact that they don't code for a protein, they form a nice secondary structure as part of the ribosome. Uh, and that means that they have these nice regions that are conserved um, and uh, more relaxed. Uh, and it's thought that these are a very good marker essentially for different types of uh, microbiome profiling. It's very nice because it's universal. So it meaning that it's found in bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So the, the 16S gene is actually what was used to sort of find these three major domains of life. We'll talk about 18S, but the fact is, is that 16S gene and 18S are homologs, right? So we just call it 18S in eukaryotes. But it's actually the same gene uh, as in, in bacteria. We just call it something different. This is always super confusing, but that means why we can make a nice phylogenetic tree like that. So it, overall, it's a great marker. It's been used for a long time. There's a lot of history here. And even though there may be other better candidates actually nowadays, the reality is the databases that we use, the amount of studies that have already like essentially profiled different 6 s genes out there is so massive that we have a really good sampling depth on a lot of different 6 s genes. <clears throat> so by far the most common, we hear about 16S, right? We hear about 16S. And, and for that, that's gonna be targeting primarily bacteria and archaea. And we'll talk about that in a bit more in a second. There are other marker genes out there you might come across for bacteria. Probably the other big candidate is CPN60, chaperone and 60. I see it pop up every once in a while, especially in particular labs out there, but you will see it as a marker. It is beneficial in a couple of cases. One is that uh, it's only in a single copy, which is really nice. We'll talk about copy number later. Uh, and then we often see it in, uh, I see a lot in vaginal, set, vaginal sort of microbiome studies. It seems to have a bit better resolution there. But it is another target that, that you'll see that, that we'll see used out there. If you're interested in eukaryotes, right, not bacteria or archaea, you often see 18S, right, which I just told you is homologous to 16S. Uh, but we'll also see ITS, which is this intertranscribed sequence. I'm not going to talk about a lot today, 
but let's just let you know there's an ITS-1 and an ITS-2. And in those applications, they're really good for re uh, resolving basically fungal communities, right? So you'll see a lot of someone's really interested in fungal communities, maybe some protists, they'll often target ITS and not just ATS. So that sort of covers our three domains of life. And then if, I don't know if there's anyone interested in viruses, the poor viruses, they always get left out. Anyone interested in viral sort of microbiome? I see one, I see two maybe, right? So for viral microbiome, sometimes people will use a couple of specific markers, but typically I would say nowadays, it's I don't see it used at all. So really for those applications, you're usually gonna to go to metagenomic sequencing. You're gonna to try to purify for those viruses. Uh, and then you're gonna, go down usually that road, unless there's a particular class of viruses that you yeah. have a, a target for. But there's no universal say, gene that's found in all viruses that we can easily sequence. Okay, so if you focus in a bit on 6 nuts, because that's what we're gonna talk about, but I'm happy to, you know, people to interrupt me about, hey, what about going back to 18S or ITS? What's the difference here? I'm happy to talk about those things. But if we talk about 6 nuts a little bit more, we also get into these variable regions. Uh, and so, as I mentioned before, variable regions come up. This is just a plot showing on the right. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, this is just showing basically conservation across the genes. The genes about 1,400 base pairs long. And you get basically con conserved areas, which is shown here. And then you'll get more variable regions down here. So this is great from like a sequencing standpoint and PCR amplifying. Conserved regions, great for designing your primers, right? Because these are conserved. Uh, and then you get the variability to give you some resolution across those different tags. So, so then because of this, uh, and the fact that most of our sequencing uh, up until just a few years ago was mostly using short read sequencing, either four, five, four back in the day, but primarily we're talking about all Illumina now, right? Illumina sequencing, well, I'm not gonna talk about sequencing a lot, but Illumina reads tend to be shorter, right? We're talking about 150 base pair to 300 base pairs long, on the forward and the reverse, right? So because you only have 300 and 300 max, you're not gonna cover the whole 1400 base pair gene. Right? It's just not possible. So then you have to pick a variable region. You have to pick what region of the gene you're gonna sequence. And this has been up for debate for a lot of time. People have their fair, favorite variable regions out there. Uh, anything around the V4 region is very popular, V5 as well. But people used to do V1, V3. Uh, people will do V6, V8. I'm not going to get into the debate of it, but I am going to talk about the fact that different variable regions will give you slightly different views. And then also the primers that you use will also have certain biases. So this is just from actually from the IMR website. We put this up because I, I thought it was quite useful. And what we just show here, I know there's a lot of information here, but what we're just showing is different variable region targets on the left. And then basically the percentage of, um, of genomes within those different taxonomic groups that are theoretically amplified by that primer pair, okay? And so what we see is we do a lot of V4, V5 sequencing right now. We call that universal because in theory, we actually get pretty good representation across archaea, bacteria, cyanobacteria, eukaryotes, and then you'll also pick up mitochondria and chloroplast DNA. Now, just a bit of an aside, just because we're covering all the bases here, mitochondria, chloroplasts, they have a 16S distant homolog, uh, uh, homolog, right? So what happens is even though you're not really thinking about trying to amplify up, say, mitochondria or, or chloroplasts, which are found in plants, right? Sometimes you'll actually amplify up that DNA, especially if your sample is really enriched with say human cells or host cells or plant material, you'll actually sometimes see that signal come through. If your sample is really rich in bacteria or archaea, you don't have to worry about it because it's very minor contributor, but you will see that pop up. So that's V4 or V5. We do a lot of that sequencing and we just reference uh, the, the source for that. Uh, sometimes if you're interested in archaea specific, we have a V6, V8 a specific primer that mostly focuses on archaea uh, as well as a V6, V8 in bacteria with the benefit here that it doesn't do as much amplification on these off bacterial uh, uh, taxonomic groups. And then you can see here that we have other, other groups as well. Uh, and so the, you know, the reason I'm mentioning this is that you will have to think about if you haven't done 6 sequencing, 
you know, what variable region are you going to do? And if the sequencing's already been done, hey, maybe I should think about what off targets I might get in my sample, right? What other things may I sequence that maybe I don't want in there that I should try to filter out or just be aware of when I'm doing the, the processing. Uh, and then besides the fact that they have slightly different targets is this effects of sort of biases, right? You're going to essentially get certain primary groups essentially um, amplifying up certain taxonomic groups a bit better than others. Uh, and so this is just an example from our, a paper back in 2017 when we first started the IMR, just comparing this V4 versus uh, V6, V8. And then this was using a standard uh, uh, 20 taxa HMP mock community in the middle. So these are all in, in same amounts. And what you can see here is, yeah, I mean, overall the taxonomic, you know, it looks pretty good, but you can see there's biases in both directions, right? So with the V6, V8, we see actually pretty low levels of helicobacter compared to the, uh, compared to V45 and compared to the mock, that's this little purple line. Uh, sorry, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Light purple, because I was gonna talk about this other purple. Uh, whereas down the bottom for the propion bacterium, you know, we see basically none of it in the V4, V5, but really good in the V6, A. So, you know, the take home message here is that there's gonna be trade offs across your variable regions. And the other big thing is if you're comparing, you know, a data set done with this particular primer set, this particular variable region, and comparing it to another data set, they're not gonna, they're not gonna agree. They're just fundamentally not going to agree. <laughs> okay. So it basically means, you know, if you ever wanted to really compare uh, the two, you're going to have to really think about what you're comparing there. You're not going to be able to just throw them on, like, say, a nice plot and see that, you know, there's a nice biological signal. The technical bias is huge. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing I want. Yes, question. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's one uh, PCR uh, uh, product spanning the V4 and the V5 region. Yep, that's a good question. Yeah, and for most of those primer pairs, they're all, all for all of them actually, it's all one PCR product. Yep, there has been a couple of groups do this where they sequence different variable regions and then try to combine the data after. It gets really messy. It's kind of complicated. I don't know if I'd really suggest it. There's probably other better options out there. Maybe this one actually. So uh, because I said Illumina has these short reads, can only span certain variable regions. Uh, of course, you've heard probably about long reads, right? Either coming from Nanopore or PacBio or Pacific Biosystems it's called. So those are the two leaders in really long read technology. Uh, and so for PacBio at least, I'm not as familiar with Nanopore. So if anyone has done Nanopore on 6 Nest, I'd love to hear about it. But for PacBio, the accuracy in general is not great, right? But now PacBio, well, it's always had this way to basically do this consensus, uh, circular consensus sequencing, right? So the basic what they have is a PCR product in the middle. They add what they call these smart bells on the end. And now for this one, you know, one uh, PCR product, you actually sequence it over and over. So yeah, the first read through, you only get about 85 to 90% accuracy, but because you read through it multiple times and it's the same molecule, you actually generate very high accuracy as long as you've gone around it enough times. So for that, they call these hi-fi reads if you're in the, into the techie uh, lingo, but it means that we can do you know, full length 16S sequencing or full length 18S sequencing or full length ITS sequencing that spans all those variable regions. And the biggest benefit is that pack file pricing has come down. So it's, it's still a little bit higher than Illumina, but it's, it's, it's pretty close now. Yeah. And it's probably going to take another plummet here soon because they've announced a new, another new sequencing machine. So just give you a, you know, a rough idea. We're talking 16S is maybe like $20 a sample to sequence it, depending on where you're sequencing it at. Uh, for us, for pack file sequencing, I think we're charging around $40. So it's about double, but you do get less depth right now, but just to give you an idea of, of what we're talking about there. Okay, so that's sequencing. Let's get into you know, the actual bioinformatics. Any, any questions about sequencing PCR products? Good, great. Right. Anyone doing non-6NS sequencing? Like anyone doing ITS or 18S sequencing? One, two, three, sure, four, five, great. Okay, good, great. 
The good news is even if you're doing 6 nests or something else, the basic steps, five max steps are gonna be very similar, just slight, slight tweaks. So for, uh, so for platforms for doing the bioinformatics, there's really two big competitors here. I would say Chime uh, and, and Mother. They've been around since the start of, you know, I would say microbiome stuff. I would say Chime wins out on the, on the popularity contest, but Mother has not gone anywhere and has been sort of really still in the background and you still see it just, people still love it. And I don't really have a big preference here. We tend to use Chime in my lab. Um, that's it. I'm not going to play favorites here. <laughs> we are going to use, though, I guess, uh, a sort of a chime flavored, definitely workshop for the lab. And we're also going to probably use a chime flavored sort of major steps. But that being said, the steps are very similar in Mother. Oh, that's not the right keyboard. Okay, so if we break this down into sort of different steps, what we're going to start with is for, for talking about this and with the lab is, you know, you're going to have your sequence data. You're going to have your raw sequence data coming off of a sequencer. I mean, we're going to probably assume it's Illumina for right now. Uh, and then we're going to do a bunch of stuff to that. We're going to, we're going to demultiplex it. We're going to stitch reads together. We're going to quality filter. I'm going to talk about all these steps in a, in a second. After that, we're going to go into OTU or ASD picking. Uh, and so that's in a really important step, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. Once we do that, we're going to go into, you know, how we assign taxonomy to those sequences, how we build an ASV table, and then on the other side, just, you know, how you uh, use those reads also to build a phylogenetic tree, because this ASV table and your phylogenetic tree, along with your metadata table, are going to be the three sort of major outputs that you're going to use for a lot of downstream analyses. And you're gonna do that maybe within Chime, but you're also gonna do it you know, in Excel, you can put it into R, but basically you're gonna to get to this point where you have process data, and then you're gonna do a lot of what I would say, sort of real, where the real bioinformatics starts. You start playing a lot with the data, trying to visualize it, trying to make sense of it. And whereas these steps, although definitely there's lots of variation, you know, your hope is that you can get through that fairly, fairly straightforward. Okay, uh, so uh, just some of the, the real basics here. So often one of the first steps would be demultiplexing. A lot of times sequence machines will actually do this for you nowadays. So you might already have it demultiplexed, but literally it just means that you have one file sometimes coming off a sequencer that contains all of your sequence data across multiple samples, right? So because we run sequencers that can generate a lot of data, they're not saying our sequ sequencers anymore, right? We can run data a lot, at a lot of samples on a single sequencing run. We don't need all of the data for one sample, right? So because of that, we multiplex uh, multiple samples onto a single sequencing run. So for instance, for the MySeq, we tend to actually multiplex about 380 samples onto a single MySeq run, right? You could do more or less. If you did less, you would just get more sequences per sample. You multiplex those by simply incorporating some sort of DNA part code into the actual Amplicon product. So you have your Amplicon product, you add a barcode different ways. And then when you sequence it, now you have a sequence plus a barcode, okay? Uh, and then at the afterwards you do sequencing, now you just use that barcode to say, okay, this sequence was from this sample, this sequence was from this sample, and you filter it all. Fairly straightforward. Uh, and because it's fairly straightforward, most sequencers will do this for you. You upload the barcode to the sequencer, and then it does the demultiplexing for you. And it gives you a fast Q file for every sample separately. Okay? So that's demultiplexing. Not really complicated, um, but it is an essential step. So then you move on to quality filtering. Uh, and so we've talked about quality filtering sometimes in previous workshops quite a bit, and I'm not going to go into as much detail, but it is very important, but it's also quite variable depending on your type of data. But obviously quality filtering is important, right? We don't want junk in, junk out, or different terminology for saying junk in, junk out. Um, but you want to essentially remove, you know, sequences that you think are not very good or trim certain sequences that aren't very good. So for certain types of sequencing like Illumina, which is probably the biggest name in town, 
classic is that you're going to get fairly high quality across your sequence read, and then you're going to see your quality drop off towards the end of your sequencing read. So that's pretty standard. And this is just what this is showing. So this is a scale showing the quality of your, of your read. And then this is the base position along the read. And you'll see these plots quite a bit from different types of uh, tools to view that, that quality. The quality score is you know, encoded in those FASTQ files. FASTQ, Q stands for the quality, right? So you get the read, plus you get a, a quality score for every single base in that read. Using that information, you can then you know, put those files through different ways to filter the data. Right? You could imagine, okay, maybe I trim these reads back, meaning I'll just get rid of the last part of every read. More so, what we see is that often within reads, you'll get lower quality reads across the whole thing. You'll actually get ambiguous bases. And then so the easiest is just because sequencing is fairly cheap, we just say we don't want this read, right? We don't want, we don't, we don't want that read downstream. So for methods for filtering, there's lots of different criteria. Right, so we could say there's a minimum base quality that we need, a Q, a Q of over 30, maybe across the whole thing or on average. Um, maybe it's a minimum percentage of high quality bases, you know, a maximum number of ambiguous bases. Usually we just say if there's one or more ends, we don't want the read. Uh, or you can set a minimum read length as well. Lots of different tools out there. We're going to use Cut Adapt in the um, in the lab today, but Trimmatic is out there. Sickle is another tool. You can do your own thing if you like. There's there's tons of ways out there, but some sort of filtering is, is a good idea for sure, okay? The other thing that we'll often do now in the lab is we'll actually also remove any reads that don't have our primer, right? So sometimes you'll get some off-target sequences in there. Uh, and a way to sort of check for that is we'll just to say, hey, we know what primers should be in our sequencing read. We're going to check for that primer. If it's there, we'll keep the read. If it's not, we're not even going to waste our time with trying to figure out what it is or why it's there. And so we'll remove those. And so we'll see that we can feed those to tools like cut adapt. This is my primer pair. Check for this. Keep the read. And then we'll, we'll, trim, that bar, we'll trim that primer pair off that read as well for downstream analysis. Anybody use any filtering tools besides the ones I've listed? What's your favorite? Yes, what's your favorite? Yep. Here it looks like your quality has reached more than any time input, which I knew was a batch, you know, you um, put all your pieces together and then send them all to the smaller length on time. Yes. Um, you generally recommend more than any period of time. So yeah, so you can do this within Chime for sure. And some of the filtering will also happen, and we're going to get into denoising, I think, in the next slide or the next one after that. Some of this filtering will also happen at that stage. You're going to lose reads because you're, depending on the denoising method you use, it's going to remove those, those reads as well. So normally you would, this quality filter is going to first, and then all the you do is just going to take the smallest error and we'll send all the filter again. Yes, and we're gonna. You'll see how the the flow. But usually, we want to try to filter out anything sort of low quality before getting into denoising or correcting for sequencing error after that. And that can happen within Chime or or like outside of Chime. Yeah. So, is there other questions or comment about tools that you use for quality filtering? No. Oh, yep. Yep. Well, they all work sort of the same in that they all do some sort of quality filtering. Um, but with most of them, they'll have different defaults and then they'll have different options for how you want to remove move reads. So trimmatic by this by the sounds of it is really good for trimming reads as opposed to to removing them. Cut adapt, we tend to use a lot because it's really nice for feeding in like these primer pairs, which I, I don't think trimmatic has that option. Uh, and sickle, I'm not sure the benefit of it versus others, but in, in all the different combinations, they just have slightly different ways of doing it. And it's not that really one's better than the other. I'll say this a lot. <laughs> it's just that people come at these problems from really different angles and, and people tend to have their favorites that they stick with. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so you have some, we have some filtering that's happened. The next step we're often going to do, often, not always, but often, is we're going to actually uh, join or stitch our reads together. So again, this is a bit unique only to Illumina. It wouldn't apply to something like pack biosequencing. But Illumina produces a forward read, which is what's shown as this arrow on top. And it produces a, a reverse read, right? And if we're doing an amplicon sequence that's a set size, we should understand how well that forward and reverse read overlap, right? So in an ideal world, we would get a read like this because we've designed our amplicons to overlap. And then this overlap is used to essentially join the forward and the reverse read together into a single longer read, okay? We know that those two reads belong together because we know it's forward and reverse. We know it comes right off the sequence of that way. There's no guesswork. Um, if you're doing, say, metagenomic data, as uh, if you're doing metagenomic sequencing, right, your fragment length is, is variable. It's not a certain size, right? So metagenomic sequencing length would often be larger than our amplicon. In that case, your four and reverse read don't overlap, right? So you can't really stitch those together. Uh, in other cases, the amplicon could be really short. They actually run past each other. It's just showing that option. But that's with metagenomic data, as we'll talk about tomorrow, you often won't do this stitching step because the forward and reverse reads don't overlap. And so you just treat your forward reads and your reverse reads either as two different independent views on the sample, or you just combine them together. And we can talk more about that tomorrow. But for Amplicon data, often we'll try to stitch or join those together. You can you know, just do forward reverse only, reverse read only. People sometimes do that, but Again, the default for us is usually to try to join those together. So tools for doing that, uh, we used to use a pair a lot in the lab back in the day, uh, but now we just run vSearch within Chime that will do this stitching for you. And you'll see that in the lab. It's just it's been pretty straightforward. Yep, question. Does that mean you have the size like the forward or reverse and the That's right. That's right. Yeah, and so when we first started, actually, we you'll see a lot of um, sequencing early, and still actually to this day, where people would do just say V4, just by itself. And that's because, uh, one, they would use only 150 base pair reads instead of 300s often, or certain people like to really see complete overlap of their four numbers reads for quality. Um, but by design, and I would say for the, at least for the IMR, we designed those primers to be about 400, 450 base pairs to get this over on. Yeah, yeah question over here. Yeah. If you're doing like the ICS where you can like type for variable species and bubble species, is yeah. there what other considerations that your primer pairs can be made to try and get around that? Yes, that's a really good question. So it's about ITS. Um, you get you don't get this nice even length. You basically get very um, you get variants across different species, essentially, where the IPS can be shorter or longer, right? Um, so the way we usually handle that is we'll often try to join the reads to sort of see how much we lose, right? Um, if, you're, if you're getting pretty good stitching across, it means that, you know, there hasn't been too much outside of it. And so we'll, we'll try to join them and see, like, what percent of our reads are kept after. So if we get 80, 90 percent, well, okay, we're going to stitch it. But if you're throwing away, you know, if half your reads don't stitch together or join, then you're going to have to do sort of a forward read by itself and a reverse read by itself and sort of combine them at some point downstream. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we get on to the fun topic of denoising. So let's just see how we're doing. Very good. Okay. So denoising, what is this? And so uh, this is where we get into this idea of OTUs and ASDs, and my, my hope is here to explain it to you so you understand the benefits of both. So when we do this sequencing of, of different types of amplicons, you can imagine in this little cutout, we have uh, our, imagine we have two organisms, okay? Uh, red and yellow, we have blue and gray. And because of sequencing error, we're actually gonna generate reads that don't perfectly map to this organisms up there, right? So you can imagine you, you have a base pair off or two base pairs off. You're going to get a read that's close to this, right? But not exactly this, okay? 
That can be problematic if you also have another organism that's also just two or three base pairs away from, from that from that type of six net kind of thing. And then over here, this represents a different tax of this much more distant state of the next year. Okay. So you're still going to basically get a cloud if you think about sequencing errors of you know mismatches or base pairs that are called wrong, right? But actually belong to this, this one point. Okay, so it's just a product of the sequencing itself. You're going to get sequence errors. <laughs> They're not going to map perfectly 100% when you, when you look at them. So one way to handle that historically, and I almost didn't put this in because really we don't hear as much about OTU, so I think historically it's still good to understand where this came from, is to basically just collapse those and cluster them at some percent idea, identity, uh, and we call those operational taxonomic units. So historically, you would have seen people cluster any sequence that's at 97% identity or greater. Now, you could do different O2 cutoffs, but you would typically see a 97% identity. Why 97%? Because someone thought it sort of equaled about a species, right? So an O2 and a species, you can kind of interchange those two words in your head. Many species would have not always, 97% identity or higher, okay? So that's one approach. Uh, and OTUs were used in the field for a long time, but you can see that if we do that, right? So if we can imagine that all these sequences here are within 97%, now we're calling this one thing, but we actually know it's two things, right? So you're losing that resolution. You're losing 3% resolution. So now we have two things, called at OTU level, but really there's there's four. But it's beneficial because we don't have this sequencing error problem. The other approach really is instead of just simply clustering them, is to try to model that error in the sequencing and to correct for it such that we actually get the original, you know, the real biological uh, sequence, right? So in a perfect world where ASD following or amplifying sequence there in, would differentiate this group from this group. Now there's different approaches for this denoising step, um, right? One of them you can really think of is that from a sort of popularity context, right? Most of your sequences, basically this taxa, are gonna form this big, this big group. And then you can say, well, if it's one base pair away from this big group, then maybe we're gonna put it in there. We also know from a little bit of data, so I showed you the quality control that we would expect more errors at the end of the read, right? And you can model those errors and then you can try to collapse them together. So the short end, you know, the short answer to all this is that, you know, should you be using ASVs or OTUs? I would say across the board, probably ASVs. Um, and then the big question is after that is, you know, what type of uh, ASVs? Now, I remember... Yes, sure. So just repeat the question. I Yes. Uh, so the question, I guess, is around does ASVs, you know, sometimes get it wrong? And do you make different things that weren't different? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and we actually see that we still got it wrong with OTUs a lot of times. Um, and you'll see different approaches uh, do a better job or not of collapsing them down to the original sequence. As you can imagine, this is an approximation, right? This, especially as you get more rare taxa, it becomes really more differentiated to say, is this a real thing or is this a sequencing error? So both, both happens, yeah. I'm not gonna talk about this. I think I'm gonna skip over it, but there is different approaches to OTU picking. Um, there was de novo clustering, which is just sort of what I described. You just cluster everything, closed reference, where you map things to a, a database of sequences and open reference, which is kind of like a hybrid between those two. I don't think we need to go into it, but if anyone has questions about it, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, and then I would say much more popular now is, is ASVs. 
ASVs are also sometimes called sub OTUs back when this came out and uh, there was another term circulating for a while, but I think we've all decided on ASVs now. Yeah. Big methods out there are probably Data2 and Dublur are the two that we're gonna really talk about. Unoise2 uh, was made by Robert Edgar, it still exists out there as well. So uh, in my lab back in 2018, we tend to do this a lot where we're like, okay, we have to figure out which one's best and then some, some poor sap gets the job of, as I look at Rob, no, she's not a poor sap, she's really good. Uh, you know, a student or trainee, you know, tends to take it on and says, okay, let's compare the tools and then we'll know which one's the best. And then we're gonna pick the best one from now on. And in every one of those cases, it's never a clear best tool. It's just like, you're just left with this like, oh, they're all sort of different in different ways. Uh, so that's really hard. But what I'm showing you here essentially, uh, and again, a mock community of expected, uh, and that's comparing data two versus the blur, uh, and new noise, and then O2 was a, a standard O2 clustering method. So what do you see there? You see some slight differences, but on a fairly simple mock community, they look, they all look pretty good. You can definitely spot some biases there across them. Uh, and then one thing that we talk about a lot is total ASCs or O2 counts. You will see that with OTU, you would actually generate, you would think less, uh, but you actually do create quite a few spurious OTUs. Um, and that too, the blur, the blur being a bit more, I would say, collapsing a bit more so than data two. That all being said, they all have different parameters and options going into those tools. And so depending on how you sort of run them, you will get different answers. Um, for tools that we still sort of hassle about in the lab, we're going to run the blur, I think, in the tutorial. The blur tends to be faster. Faster is not always better, uh, but we will be running the blur. But often we will use that to depending on the situation. And what would that situation be? It, it, it's probably maybe that the blur just seems to really be not doing a great job. Sometimes it over filters the data and you lose a lot of your reads. And so we're, we're not satisfied with that. And we'll go to data two and, and, and run that. And we find that if you have the time and patience, data two is usually the better approach, but data two also usually requires often some uh, training a bit on your data ahead of time. And so it's just a little bit more, maybe a little bit more expertise required, I guess. Whereas the player is pretty, quick and dirty, and for most applications, does get the job done. But I'm not, again, here to say which one's better, but both are supported well. Uh, if you're moving to something like a uh, track file, like long read, I think data two is the only one that will sort of handle those right now. I don't think the blur handles long reads. Uh, okay. Right, okay, any questions about denoising? All right, That's, oh, there's one question over here, sure. No, go for it. Uh, like you're comparing these different softwares, right? Um, and the trends you're seeing, for example, you gave us at like a species and genus level, right? Do you see those similar trends like at like higher levels of tech level? you know, at the families genus level? Yeah, and not as much for sure. Uh, so if you start to collapse the genus, it's definitely at the level of a lot of that heterogeneity goes away pretty quickly. Uh, one thing that was really troublesome, if you dig through that paper, I didn't do a pretty thorough analysis, but you'll see, actually, it's really hard to make some of a synthetic community that you're really super confident in, that there's not something else in low level. And so you actually sometimes pick up these things that you're like, well, it's really sequencing a lot here. It, it, maybe it's there. So even though they say 20 things, oh, or there could be a few extra. And so, you know, having a gold standard is, is actually kind of difficult sometimes on that side. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move on to taxonomy assignments. Is that one? Oh, sorry. Question there. Right. 
Uh, not sure if I got all the questions. So the question again, if you're looking at rare species. Yeah, and the services that were supposed to make patients that are working using ADSP, like how often can it be? Oh, how often can it be? Well, that's a philosophy question right there. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it, sort of for us, this rare types of thing comes down often is sequencing data, right? Um, I, I don't know. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Uh, so say in our lab, we're not so interested in rare tags all the time. So we're kind of ruthless with like different types of filtering, which we'll talk about after to sort of remove the small tail. Because across the board, what you see with most of the communities is the approaches tend to overinflate the number of things reported. That's the that's for like ASC and OTs. And so obviously they're not doing a perfect job of collapsing that sequence together. So I, I guess it just depends on, on what you're doing with, with it downstream. If, you know, biologically, if you're looking at, say, we're going to talk about peak away flocks later today, they're not influenced that much by this rare tail. But it comes down to, hey, if you start reporting about, you know, it's really rare taxa being different, then maybe you're going to want to go back and check out, you know, how many reads do I actually have for that rare test? I'm not confident that, you know, I want to say three reads versus 10 reads is really significant, right? So that'll come into statistics later on. But yeah, if we have like 50 reads versus, you know, 80 reads, then it looks pretty good. So I, I don't know. I guess it depends on your threshold a bit. I don't know if I answered it completely. Yeah, okay. Okay, so. Uh, let's move on. So now we have, okay, now we have sort of exciting points, right? This is where I think most people would like coming in the field be like, oh, I have a sequence read. I, I want to know what it is. We had to do all the stuff. We had to do filtering. We had to denoise it. We had to pair it. Now we have a sequence which we think represents the real biological signal, right? And we have a count for that sequence too. So we just have a single sequence for it. And we say, okay, that's been there 10 times in the sample. It's 20 times in the sample. We, we know how many times we've seen it in that sample. What do we do with it now? Well, we can do different things. One is you can actually do analyses without doing any sort of annotation of it. We don't have to assign taxonomy to it. We can just literally call those things ASV1, ASV2, ASV3. And then you can do a lot of the analysis that we're gonna talk about later on today on that table without any sort of labels, without you know saying what it is, right? Um, Often what you'll see is, uh, sometimes you will see these labels, 021, 02, 2345, or ASV, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You'll also sometimes see this really long string of characters that look like garbly gook as a label. That's just an, what we call an MD5 sum label. And it's really technical. I don't think I want to get into it, but it just means that reliably, it means if you filter, if you put a sequence, like a DNA sequence or anything, into an MD5 sum checker, it'll spit out this, this unique hat, this unique, oh my God, I'm using computer science terminology, a unique character string, and it'll always generate that. So some of the biofact tools will generate these, what we call F MD5 sums. Just think of it as a unique identifier for that DNA string that's shorter and reproducible. Does it really matter? It doesn't really matter, but you could, you know, in your head, you could replace it with ASV one, two, three, four, five. It just means that like, if you did analysis and someone else did analysis, you know, and you call different things, different labels, the MD5 sum would actually give you the same identifier. And I just mentioned it because it's super confusing and people are like, what's this weird label I get? That's just a random string of characters. Okay, so that's all said, of course, we want to assign taxonomy to it, right? Why do we do that? Well, one, it's easier to communicate. We can talk about things. We can't just say, hey, I get this ASV with A, T, G, C, D, G, A, C, G, T, okay, you know. So we can talk about things, communication. We imply sort of certain tax that have different functions, right? So we know like if you're talking about cyanobacteria versus, uh, uh, you know, Prochlorococcus versus Bifidiobacteria, like all those names mean something. Sort of, there's context behind them. It's actually what started PyCrest, if you're interested in that later. Uh, and then the other big thing it really does is it allows us to group things quite nicely, right? So we taxonomy has this structure 
right? So we can collapse species into gen genera. We can collapse genuses into family. We can collapse those to different levels. And so it's easily collapsible to different levels to understand, you know, how those differences go at different sort of taxonomic resolutions. Now, one thing I don't think I mentioned later is that often for 16S at least, we often don't get down to this species sort of level definition. We get to the family level, we get to the genus level. Sometimes we get to the species level, maybe depending on your data set, 25, 40% of the time to the species level definition. But for a lot of them, you're not gonna get down to that level. So what do you do? Well, you could just go back to your ASVs, right? So if someone says, I do an ASV analysis, you're not taking taxonomy, you're basically saying, I'm gonna count all these things at 100%. Right, and so you can think of as ASV almost like a species level analysis without the taxonomic labels, and that way you don't lose things essentially in your in your analysis. But just goes to show you, say if you say, okay, I'm going to do a difference at species level, it's only going to be based on anything that could be assigned a species level name. Okay, okay, so taxonomy assignment. This is also a big can of worms, but uh, maybe not as complicated as denoising. But essentially, there's different approaches to doing this. And the two big things that are important is your database and your method for assigning your sequences to this database. Okay. Now, really the big one in town is, I would say, Naive Bayes is used by Chime, is very popular, and uh, is really the, I would say, I, I think, what, like 95% of people probably use Naive Bayes for the assignment. You could blast your sequences, right? With something like Blast, you, there's other tools out there called RDP Classifier and RTAX. Uh, but often what you'll see is a naive Bayes approach. And then the other big choice, more so than the method, is probably the database that you map to. So you could use RDP, which is, um, oh, why am I drawing a blank on what RDP stands for? The ribosome database? <laughs> okay, it's, anyway, it doesn't matter, it's RDP. Uh, green genes and silver are probably the big three. Uh, and in all those cases, they're going to give you, you know, ranked taxonomy names, uh, but they're not going to agree with each other. It's always fun. Taxonomy is just awful. <laughs> um, so again, which, which one should you use? Um, uh, I would say RDP has really, you don't see people classify much to RDP anymore. It was pretty popular back in the day, but you really don't see it much. And then the two that have been competing, I, I would say, over the years has been Silva versus Green Jeans. Now, Green Jeans was really popular back when it was sort of newly minted in 2012. Uh, it was really pushed by Chime for many years. Uh, and then it wasn't updated for quite a while. And I would say everyone switched to Silva in the past five or so years. I would say everyone sort of started using Silva as the main database. Still pretty safe using Silva, I think, is, is, is a really good choice. Uh, you can do that within Chime. Um, but Green Jeans 2 just came out in a preprint just recently. Uh, and so it looks like they've up, done some updates to Green Jeans. And so now you'll probably see in the coming years, some people prefer Green Jeans 2 versus Silva. Uh, and people will have heated arguments about which one is better. Uh, and so you'll have to decide which one to use. But, you know, I feel safe in using Silva, feel safe probably in using Green Jeans too. Okay. Uh, and the preference can be up to you. Yes. Questions first there and then come back. Yeah. Do you have a gene sort of based on the sound type relates to the Oh, yes. Uh, that's my next slide, maybe a little bit. Uh, across the board, though, I think it's pretty safe. No matter what you're doing, you still see people use silver. Yeah, there is, you'll see some preference, maybe. Uh, like people doing when green jeans, the first, well, it wasn't even the first one, but when green jeans sort of came out in 2012, you would see more human people doing that. And the environmental people sort of shifted towards silver because they thought it had better representation. Um, but now it, it yeah. Sorry. My next slide, Rami. My next slide. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't hear the question. On GTDB? Yeah. Okay. So GTDB, I, I almost put it in here. So 
GTDB, we'll talk about, I think, tomorrow with metagenomics, but GTDB is the Genome Taxonomy Database. Very nice. I love it. Uh, um, and it's very much starting to take care over metagenomic taxonomic assignment, which we'll see tomorrow. Now, the biggest restriction with GTDB for 16S is that it's based on genomes, right? Like genomes. So you don't have all that, you know, all the sequences that made it into Silva or green genes, you know, that they don't have genomes for. So much more comprehensive for green genes and Silva compared to say GTD, which is based on primarily genomes. Now, that being said, one of the big, you know, and I haven't dug into it fully on the preprint on green genes too, is that supposedly it plays really nice with GTDD. So finally, you know, there's this big problem where you would do 16S sequencing and metagenomic sequencing. And not only is the technology and everything really different and you can't compare, but the taxonomy would never mesh up. Like you would use a certain taxonomy based on genomes and then you have taxonomy based on 16S sequences from Silva and they just don't agree. Like they don't call the same things the same label. So it made comparing them really problematic. So the preprint actually talks about that and actually says, okay, we've actually made green genes to use the same taxonomy as GTDB so that you can actually say the thing you're calling taxa A is actually called taxa A and GTDB. And if so, then that is a really big advantage of it, I, I would think, going forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering if we're going to think about a trained modifier versus a Okay. Yeah, I, I don't go into it. Um, so this idea about training versus untrained. So uh, as I mentioned back here, um, so naive Bayes is technically, uh, I guess, the, yeah, it's classified as a, a machine learning approach for, for annotation and requires training um, of that uh, based on a certain database. You would, you would take a database you would train a class for on it called Naive Bayes, and then you would use that database for your searching. Those are all pre-made in something like Chime, so you can just point directly to it or you would download them. Um, okay, so I lost my train of thought. Yeah, so you would train using that, and then you can actually get into training about whether you train it on particular variable regions versus the whole gene. That became a big thing for a while too. Um, we have switched primarily to training on, I don't remember now. Rama, do you remember if we trained, do we use the database as just train on the whole gene now in the microbiome helper? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so to reiterate, Often you could train on particular variable regions, but then you had to have a different database for each one of those. And it can just, the, the benefits weren't as, as good as sometimes the, the difficulties, I guess, associated with that. Yeah, question. Five minutes left. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna get cut off. Okay, uh, okay, that's all right. Okay, so, and then uh, I guess an unclassified one would be something like BLAST, where essentially it's just taking a sequence to sequence approach. Okay. Uh, and then special databases, I just want to mention briefly, is uh, there are, you know, special databases out there. We do some oral microbiome, and so we often get reviewers that are like, you should use the HOMDB. Why? Because they sort of curated a list of taxa, right, that they think are relevant to the oral microbiome, and, and they essentially show that you can get better species-level definitions. Um, that all being said, uh, if your database is overly focused and not comprehensive, you can get, you know, false positives. You can get things that say, it looks like this taxa, but because it doesn't know that there's all these other taxa in the world, you, you get this, you're overconfident and you're calling it this thing when it's really not that thing, right? And so this, this paper showed that essentially you can get these false positives if you restrict your database too much. And that's why in most applications, yeah, Go big, go like silver or green genes. Although the human oral microbiome database we, we do use in the lab tends to be pretty good too. Okay, where are we? Oh yeah, okay, okay. Uh, can I go over just by maybe five minutes extra? That is, that is up to you, but that's from your lab. 
Yes. <laughs> this is this is not bad. We've we've historically gone way over, so like five minutes is not bad. Okay, so um, you're gonna get. Uh, uh, we start talking about outputs now. Okay, so you've finally sort of got through a lot of the work of assigning taxonomy to your reads to your sequences, and now you're essentially gonna get some sort of you know table. You're gonna get an OT or ASD table, whatever you want to call it, and you can think about this just like it's shown here: samples as columns rows or your ASVs, okay? And that table is just represented digitally like in lots of different formats, right? It could be in a TSV or CSV that you could load in in Excel, easy peasy. Uh, you'll see it as a QZA, which we'll talk about in a second more in Chime. Uh, there used to be this file format called Biome. There's so many different file formats just to represent a table, it's gross. Uh, but the reality is it is a table with your OT or ASV by some count of that, right? And that's a table. Then there'd be another file that has your sequence, right? For every one of those OTUs or ASVs, that's gonna be important. Those are your denoised reads, right? And then you're also gonna have a metadata file with in information about every one of those samples. Now, before you get there though, more filtering, more filtering. So you filtered based on quality, You've got to your table. Now there's sometimes this other filtering that happens. Okay. And I'm not going to go on too much about it, but there is a few different topics of, uh, of interest here. So one is this idea about bleed through ASVs. Uh, and this is that sometimes you can see on my seeks, essentially sequences shouldn't really be in that sample. Somehow they get there either from the previous sequencing run or from another barcode. And so you'll see those at really super low levels. And so you can essentially just, we tend to just remove really rare things. Now this is problematic. This is problematic if you were really into those rare things, right? <laughs> uh, but this is where I say we're a bit cutthroat uh, and we, we remove uh, those things that are below 0.1% of the mean sample depth. Interesting enough, that bleed through maybe is gonna go bye-bye with uh, NextSeq. So I'm hoping that's that's good. I, hopefully this doesn't have to be a worry in the future. It seems primarily focused on my seeks uh, and the next seeks don't show this. And if we move to more amphicon sequencing on the new next seeks, we won't have this issue, but for now it is an issue. Yeah, quick question. Uh, Like to quantify if it's actually there. Yeah, like I would like. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I think that goes across a lot of what we do. Actually, is that you know, if you're going to really take home some crazy message, especially with about rare things, to then go back in either with further PCRing it to stick for that taxa or QPCRing it possibly as well. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we'll remove contaminant ASVs. So this is like where, hey, maybe we don't want mitochondria and chloroplast DNA in your in your sample, right? I mean, it may be of interest to you, but a lot of times it's probably not. I mean, I am really cool. I've, I've been thinking about this idea of chloroplast DNA as a measure of how many veggies you eat, which I think would be super cool as an experiment to find out if it correlates, but that's a whole other side project and I have no idea if it would work. Anyway, usually we would remove those. Uh, and then often we would remove maybe other ASVs depending on different criteria. So biggest one is if you have a sample that just doesn't sequence well, right? When do we decide that that sample didn't sequence up to a certain standard and we'll remove that sample? There's no golden cutoff. Usually I get really scary once you get below a thousand, right? Usually that's usually not an issue, but you're gonna have just instances because of sequencing is not perfectly normalized. You're gonna get certain samples not sequence as well as others. And so you have to make a decision to say, you don't want a sample in there with like 200 sequences yeah. and then you're comparing it to a sample with 20,000 sequences, right? It's just too much of a difference. And so you'll have to make a cutoff and say, this sample didn't sequence well enough. Maybe you sequence it again, or maybe it's problematic. So you remove those. Uh, and then often we'll do prevalence filtering, which removes certain ASVs based on how present they are across different samples. This bleeds a bit into um, statistics, 
But essentially what we see is, you know, if a sample, if a ASV is only found in say 5% of your samples, you know, it's hard to do statistics on that unless you have a large sample size. And so it also leads to a problem of doing a lot of statistical tests, which reduce your power later on. And so we'll actually consider removing those. Again, this is good for some people, not good for others, and there's no standard here. Yeah. Is it beneficial to normalize the amount of genes to go into the cells? Say you have samples that are for 500,000. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to leave that to Hannah later on. She's going to talk all about normalizing uh, and rarefaction versus other approaches later. Yeah. Okay, uh, good for the filtering. Great. Okay, uh, and then this is going to be really quick. Basically, you know, the other big piece of it is that you'll see later is that a lot of our different diversity metrics require a phylogenetic tree for your sequences. And so that can be done a couple of different ways to build that phylogenetic tree that goes along with your ASVs, right? Um, and again, this has changed a bit over time, but you'll see things like who's heard of like who's heard of Unifrac? Quite a few people, right? That's a phylogenetic method that Hannah's probably going to talk about later. That phylogeny is needed to map every one of your ASV sequences to a tree. Okay, so you need to have a tree to put that into a phylogenetic measure like that. So different approaches for that. Uh, the two biggies are de novo. So this just means that you take all of your sequences, you align them, you make a new tree. Bam, you got a tree, easy. Now downside to that is that tree may not be super robust because it's only based on very short amount of sequence data. And then the other big approach, which I think we'll see more and more of is, oh, this is SOTUs. This is like the same as ASVs. Uh, is essentially inserting those fragments into a reference tree. So the reference tree is shown in black, and then you insert your short pieces of your sequence into that reference tree. So overall, the tree is conserved, but you get to place your reads into that tree. And so you'll see that placement approach quite a bit. You can do that within Chime, but you can do de novo, or you can do a placement approach. And again, depending on your Amplicon, maybe there's no reference tree out there. Maybe you have to do de novo, right? Either one produces a tree, but it's, I think, pretty widely accepted that this insertion approach is probably a better approach overall. Okay, okay, so with that, I'm not gonna talk about biases anymore because I think I've covered them a lot. There's a lot of biases and a lot of this, and it's gonna come up a few other times uh, over the next couple of days, but hopefully I covered the ones within marker genes. Just remember that, Anything we do, bioinformatics included, creates different biases. We talked about some of those. And so those are gonna change what you see as your output from your, from your tables. Um, since we're over time, uh, okay, just one quick fun fact. 16S gene, we think about it universal, sure, it's great. In most bacteria genomes, it's in a single copy, as in it's like in the genome once. But there are bacteria, and there's many archaea out there, where there's multiple copies of the 16S gene in the genome. So that creates a bias, uh, unfortunately. So a bias that essentially you can imagine if you have two copies of that gene in the genome, when you sequence it, it's going to look like there's twice as much. If you have three copies, it's going to look like your chance of sequencing is three times, right? So that's problematic. Uh, and basically in the field, it's well recognized, but mostly across the board is just ignored, <laughs> just people just ignore it, which is fun. Uh, there have been a few tools out there to try to correct for that. Uh, so PyCrest will actually do that as one of the steps. There was a tool specifically for that called Copywriter and, and Paprika can do that as well. But we don't see that across the board that most people do this uh, correction. I don't know why, we just we don't do it. It's really weird. You all know about it, it's a bias. We just ignore it. There was this paper from Laura Parfrey's group, which was nice that sort of went into this and showed that of all these methods, they're all not doing maybe a great job. And so maybe when you try to correct for it, you're doing just as much harm as just leaving it alone. And so, yeah, it's good to recognize that there is different copies of it, different number of copies, but you don't see it as a standard biomatic step, I would say in most amplicon sequencing steps. Yeah, question in the back. Um, is this, uh... Based on the genome, based on the sequence, and you have this formula. 
Yeah, no, it's fairly well phylogenetically conserved. That's why, like, actually, I, like PyCross is phylogenetic based, so it, it'll do an all right, pretty good job of, of predicting that. Uh, the really high multiple copies are dependent on archaea, which tends to be not a focus of a lot of microbiome studies, especially human microbiome. So halo archaea is really well known for having like seven, eight copies. Bacteria, you don't see that as much. You'll see one or two copies. Um, but yeah, but yeah, it's it's sort of well known, but you'll still see what's a new genome and you're like, oh, surprise, it's got multiple copies. Yep. Okay, so with that, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, Chime, we're going to move to in the tutorial, and Chime is going to be, uh, you know, it's a really well-known tool. Uh, you'll see within the tutorial, you're going to produce different types of files. There's these QZA files and these QZV files. QZA files are just this really nice way to package up a whole bunch of files in the directory, so you can just pass it around, uh, and it provides some provenance, which just means it tracks all the steps you've done before it. It's actually just, if you're interested, it's just a zipped file. You can actually unzip it and see all the stuff inside of it if you're ever curious. Uh, and then QZV is a nice way to take something and then you can put in Chime Viewer uh, and it makes a nice pretty graph on their, on their website. So you'll see these two files specifically coming out of Chime. Uh, and then just a quick message about Microbiome Helper. So Chime wraps a bunch of different tools Chime's great. There's a lot of documentation out there to sort of self-teach you. Uh, and in Microbiome Helper, we tend to start putting a lot of stuff on a wiki many years ago, where for our lab, we just have, you know, this is the commands you sort of run with different options that you should be aware of. And we find it pretty straightforward. And this is where we host a lot of different uh, of our, like, uh, our tutorials, but we also have our standard operating procedures. So if you're ever curious about, you know, what we're doing, say in our lab, and I'm not saying our lab is always right or anything, and it's not a one-stop shop, but you can sort of see these are the major steps we do when we analyze like a typical data set coming out of our lab. Uh, 